Well, good evening. We've been asked to announce that the funeral for Mary Jo Cooper will be Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at Hot Springs Funeral Home. Visitation will be from 6 to 7 at Hot Springs Funeral Home on Tuesday evening, and the internment will be at Morning Star Cemetery. And certainly we give our condolences to the family. This evening, I want to conclude with what I started a couple of weeks ago, and that is Jesus in prayer. And when we left off with that, we were at the point of discussing that Jesus' model prayer struck at the taproot of two essential elements of practical religion. Now, when we read this prayer, we go through it very rapidly. It takes some 30 seconds to read that prayer, maybe less. But the implications are far-reaching. And, you know, point number one to all of this is Christ is giving us points here that dealt with man's relationship to God. Now, when we look at the prayer in, in that vein, we can understand why it is that Jesus would address his prayers, and whether we call this the model prayer, the prayer in John 17, the model prayer. Our Lord and Savior is addressing the prayers to his Father. Now, he does that for a specific reason. Our Father, which art in heaven, really is appealing to the fact of whether or not we actually and truly know God as Father. Now, don't let that just be taken by you lightly. Uh, there are grave implications concerning this. Matter of fact, giving God the respect, you know, the praise, honor, and glory that uh, Brother Shelton prayed about earlier is what it's all about, the idea of worship, from the idea of uh, proskuneo, proskuneo, the any way you want to pronounce that, bowing before God, kissing the ground toward, kissing the hand of, uh, talking about reverence and respect for who God happens to be. I don't know about you, but I remember, even though my father and I did not get along, and I've told you many, many times, ad nauseum, I'm sure, meanest man ever met in my life, meanest man I've ever known in my life. But I still remember that I had to respect him when he said something. And I did that because of a small word called fear, right? My dad could look across the room at me, and I knew whether I was in mild trouble, somewhat trouble, or I was going to get a beating. I just knew it. Uh, I knew, from, and, and attaching that idea of, of, to my father, and people talked about father, and growing up, in an abusive home, as I did, and not, you know, you know, physical abuse, and that's the kind of abuse we had, physical and verbal abuse. Uh, children, my mother. Growing up in that type of home, I honestly thought all fathers were like that. I thought that's what a father was supposed to be. I thought that's how everybody's father acted until I got old enough to be at other people's homes. And then when I saw that actually... Most fathers were not like that. When you talk to other kids, and, and kids talk about, well, my dad's, not, I've never seen my dad do any of that. So the, I, what I'm, I'm referring to here is a lot of people, as I've said in the past, grow up, and whenever they hear the word father, they don't naturally conjure up thoughts of a, a safe abode or of somebody that's loving, somebody that's kind, and so it's a, a somewhat difficult transition to go from the idea of an earthly father to a heavenly father. But whenever you catch on to that idea and you see what type of, of father, and it's a sad thing. I told Vicki whenever we married, I told her, I said, you know, it's a very sad thing, but I never want to be the father my father was. I wanted to be the father her father was. You know, I saw the quietness, and I saw, you know, the, you know, the patience, and I, boy, I'm working on that one. And I saw the love, and, and I saw the respect he garnered, and I saw that when he gave me his word, his word was his word. And he was Christian, and every, every fiber of his being wanted to be Christ-like. Now, he wasn't a perfect man, we all know that, but when I think of Father, that's what I conjure up in the earthly sense. When I talk about my heavenly Father and read about it, it blows me away. Now watch what, what is said here in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, and 6. Paul said, For although there may be so-called God, small lowercase here, in heaven or on earth, in other words, he's 
you know, giving in to this idea, not condoning, but saying, okay, let's take for sake for granted. Let's just take for argument's sake. There are many gods here on heaven and earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. He said, I'm just going to come out and say that because that's what you believe. And certainly all of us understand many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God. It goes back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. He said, under the Jewish law, we had that part right, Paul is saying. There is one God. So when Jesus is on this earth and he says, this is how we pray, our Father which art in heaven. He goes on to say this, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, notice that, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So let me tell you something about this. In this old world, and it's nothing new, we hear, we've been studying in, in Bible class, uh, my Bible class over, you know, the, the exalted Bible class over here, 124. But uh, we've been studying in that class the last couple of weeks about the Muslim faith and what they believe and what they try to to employ and what they try to demand of their believers and the idea of how their God is different from the Christian God and their faith is different from our faith. And certainly it is. And Paul is saying, listen, in my time, some 600 years before Muhammad, by the way, in my time, we're wrestling with this same idea. Many gods, many lords, and here you go. When we talk and we pray, our Father, do we understand what that means, church? Jesus is talking about our relationship, man's relationship to the Heavenly Father. Do we understand it? Do we know it? Hallowed be thy name, or hallowed be thy name. What was meant by this? Well, do we reverence God properly? Do we really? Dalton and I were talking this past week about euphemisms and how euphemisms are, are used and people use, uh, use words that stand for God and stand for everything else. Sometimes they don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand what they're really saying. Use it all of their life. Do we reverence God? What does it really mean to take God's name in vain? Well, vain meaning empty, of course. But notice this, 1 Chronicles 16, 24 through 26. Scripture says, Declare His glory among the nations. In other words, it doesn't matter who's listening. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Reverend is your name. His marvelous works among all the peoples. The author of Chronicles says it doesn't matter where you are, to whom you're conversing. He said, you just shout and declare God to everyone. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. He says, we're differentiating, we're separating. Here we go. And he's talking about that, you know, that idea of, uh, of how God is to be reverenced and respected. Is he? In our homes, is he reverenced? Is he respected? I don't know how many times I've talked with husbands and wives, and I firmly believe, and we could argue about this all day long, but I, I've always believed when a man's present, a man ought to take lead in the prayer. I think that's what 1 Timothy 2 is talking about. I have a, a sermon on that. I'm going to be preaching before long. I think a man ought to be involved in that prayer if he's a child of God. But I've asked men and women, that you know, husbands and wives, I said, how often, wife, have you ever heard your husband pray? A Christian for 30, 40, 50 years never heard her husband pray. Never. I'm not talking about getting up here in front of somebody and praying. How often have your children heard dad pray in the home? And I'm talking about father specifically because I, I are one, you see. Well, almost never. Sometimes the answer is never. How often do you, you know, reading Scripture, almost sometimes, sometimes almost, and uh, um, some, maybe never. And so the, the whole idea of that is, how are we reverencing God? How are we respecting God? How are we bringing God into our house? Do we take, and you see, this is part of what I think the Lord is saying, hallowed be thy name, the reverence and the respect. Are we pushing that responsibility, man, off on someone else? Let's let the church teach the people about this. I'm not talking about standing before a congregation leading in prayer. I get it. I understand how difficult that is and how terrifying it is. It's a terrifying ordeal, is it not? You want to get it right. 
I understand that. But I wonder, in the privacy of our homes, how much we reverence and respect Almighty God. Matthew 27 and verse 54, when the centurion of those who were with, and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake that, and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. I've looked at this verse many, many, you know, over the last 36 years, looked at this verse, and I, uh, I've come to one conclusion here, one basic conclusion. I never want those who didn't believe in Christ, those who were there watching the crucifixion, watching over Him, to have more awe about Christ being the Son of God than me being a child of God. So when I pray to God, Thou Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then we get to the next part of this. Thy will be done. Boy, this is the one that really gets to us, isn't it? Thy will be done. But Father, you don't understand here. I've got a pretty strong will. I'm a pretty stubborn person. What do you mean, thy will be done? Well, this is part of that idea that we encapsulate. Are we willing to submit our wills to His? It's a very basic concept. All this is in that prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Every single bit of it, church. Our relationship to Almighty God. Are we willing to submit to His will? Watch this. John 7, 16 and 17. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but His who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. What's going to be your will? That's what he's saying here. And if you're searching for God, if anyone's will is to do God, he's going to know that my teaching is from God. That's what Jesus is saying here. And he goes on to say, James 4, 13 and 15. The author says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, watch this, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The author of the book of James, James, writing, saying to all of us, do we understand that our very sustenance, whether we have it tomorrow, depends on the will of God? Do we understand that we are children of God only by the grace of God and because it's God's will? Do we understand that we get to, to fellowship like we did today? And it's all because God lets this old world stand. It, it is God's will. And so everything we are about, it's the very will of God. And boy, when we get that, all that's in that prayer. Let's get to something else. How about another four or five minutes? Give us this day our daily bread. That's talking about, of course, our realizing and recognizing that our source of, of our needs uh, are come from God, and we're thankful to God for that. I'm going to go a little hurriedly here. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11, one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Vicki has it, verse 11, in, in her office. But thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise, fulfill, fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. God said, I'm not going to abandon you or leave you out there. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, I'm never going to forsake you, I'm never going to leave you. And then look at verse 11. This is God, this is this, trying to get us to understand that everything we have, our sustenance, it all depends on Him. I like that idea. There's an idea in Scripture where Jesus Christ is called basically the capstone, if you will. And the capstone, as I've told you before, in an arch right here that holds the arch together, keeps it from collapsing this way, is called the capstone. And it's just right there in this arch, the capstone, the support. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, Paul made the statement that Jesus Christ is the foundation. There's no other foundation in heaven laid which, can, which we have to build upon than the foundation of Christ. And verse 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Let me always realize when I bow before you, let me always realize when I awaken in the morning the way I'm going to be successful. And Dalton hit the nail on the head. You know, what's, what's true success? 
The way I'm going to understand about making each day is understand I'm serving you, Father. Let me do that. Let me not impede my own progress. Forgive us. I'm not going to get through tonight, but that's all right. Maybe a part three to this. Do we confess our sins to him properly and regularly? Brother Smith, I have no sins. The Bible says that's not true. Watch this. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, run the scriptures back. What does that mean, the truth's not in us? John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy what, church? Truth. Thy word is truth. John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the what? And the truth shall make you free or set you free. You say you have no sin? You're making the word of God to be a liar. You say you have no sin? You can't possibly be set free because you're not connected to the truth. So all of that is in this prayer. It says in verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So Jesus says, I want you to recognize who the Father is. I want you to revere Him. I want you to understand from where each and every blessing comes. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, it's only through Christ. And I want you, you know, along with this, to understand you are a sinful person and you need to pray each and every day. Forgive us! wonder why Jesus said that is a part of prayer. One more point, and we're going to close tonight. Don't want to. Thine is the kingdom. I may not close yet. Just give me about five minutes. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And the point here, of course, can we ascribe these divine possessions and attributes to God rather than usurp them? Father, this is not my kingdom. Boy, people need to learn that lesson. I've seen 36 years of ministry where people, they don't care whether they tear the church up or not because they want their way. They don't care. And every single division or split I've ever seen in the church or ever read about church, it's about a power struggle, somebody being selfish, wanting their own way. So whenever you see this, remember how Jesus told us to pray. Thine is the kingdom. And it is the power and it's the glory. The church doesn't belong to me. It doesn't. It doesn't belong to you either. We're part of it because of the grace of Almighty God. Now, as we look at this, let me get to to point number two. It dealt with man's relationship to man. I may be able to finish this yet because I'm I'm, I'm on a roll. I'm not going to quit. Word of God says, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. There's a big one. Imagine that prayer. Jesus, and I'm, going to, I'm, I'm not being belligerent or flippant concerning this, Jesus knew obviously what he was doing when he said, I want you to pray this way because it catches every one of us, doesn't it? Jesus was saying, I want to, I'm going to, you pray this prayer. Father, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us as we forgive those that transgress against us, another translation says. You know what he's saying? Put the microscope on me. Hold me accountable to this. Father, I've got to have a right heart. We must be forgiving in order to expect forgiveness. Notice this. I love this part of Scripture. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, in other words, you're right in the middle of worship, right? You're worshiping God and you offer your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. This is before the church is established, remember? Part of the Sermon on the Mount. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Jesus says, I'm not going to listen to you or accept your offer, or your offering, if you will, until you are right with your brother. He says, you make that right, and notice the responsibility that is is given here. Well, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Boy, I like that one too. Uh, 
Do we do our part in avoiding temptation and sin, which involves others? And do we safeguard our influence on others so as not to cause them to sin? Now, church, watch this scripture carefully, Luke 17, 1 and 2. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. We get that. You get that idea there. Jesus saying, look, sin's going to be everywhere. But it best not come through you. You want me to tell you why? He says it would be better for him if a millstone, you know, have you ever seen a, a millstone, a grinding stone? Those are big things. You understand that? It is huge. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Jesus says, you have a responsibility to the kids. Now you take that responsibility and run with it. You understand that you have an influence. And your influence begins at your home. And I talked about dads and about mothers. And our children are learning how to be parents from us. Now that's scary. Brother Jack, you ever made a mistake as a parent? Yes. Once? No. Many, many times. Yes. You ever acted in a way you hope your children never act? Absolutely. You ashamed of that? Absolutely. You see, in all of this, the Word of God still says, you know, I, I, I hopefully I've never taught my children how to sin. I hope I've never done that. And I've said for years and years and years, you look at the young ones, we are so blessed at this congregation, I'm preaching now, we are so blessed at this congregation with the young people that we have. Little bitty kids and running around. You, you see the potluck today? We must have had 7,000 kids over there. I mean, you have playing going on and screaming going on and crying going on and pushing and shoving and it's beautiful. Every congregation needs that, right? Our kids are there. Now, which one of us is going to be guilty of causing one of them to lose their salvation? Which one? How many? Brother Jack, none of us want that. That's what Jesus is telling us to pray about in not only Luke 17, but also in the sermon in Matthew chapter 6. We need not be involved in all of that ideas of temptation and bringing sin in and, and uh, you know, certainly need to be responsible for who we are. Well, that's the lesson on prayer, two lessons on that. I may get to more of those in the future because you seem to like it so well and you, everybody stayed awake, I can see, so that's good. But please understand, and I'm not being frivolous about this at all, one of the greatest privileges we have is to be able to pray to the Heavenly Father. And I hope none of us avoid that privilege as being His children. I know I love to hear from my kids. I give them fits. But I love to hear from my kids. Karen still talks about, and uh, you know, the times she used to like to watch scary movies. And there were times when I'm guilty as anyone I would hide in the closet after she had watched one and run out of the closet and she'd pass out on the bed and it's a dad's duty. And uh, other times I've hidden under the bed, grabbed her ankle. I'm guilty of that. What's that have to do with prayer? Nothing. I just want to tell you how, what kind of guy I am. It has everything to do with everything because we have all of these memories that we share. Memories of, and I've told you before, when Karen and Randy got married. Karen, every single morning, I'm going to tell you this, I know I've told you this ten times, but every single morning, Karen would always leave a wash rag in my sink. There in the, in our Vicky and I's bedroom, we have a, a bathroom, of course, uh, off the bedroom, and she'd always leave a wet wash rag, her wash rag in my sink, every single morning of her life. And she did it because it annoyed me. I have to pick it up and go put it in the hamper that she walked by to put it in my sink. So every Karen Renee, can you not pick up after yourself? <laughs> you know, like that. Karen and Randy, after they got married, you know, we watched them drive away. And I went in and got undressed, walked into the bathroom, and there was a wet wash rag. 
in my sink. And I cried like a baby. Don't tell her that. But there are memories there. That's what I'm getting to. And I could tell you bunches about Christy too, but I'm not. I don't have that time this evening. But the point being in all of that, those memories are great memories. I would hate to think as a parent that I invited something into my house that caused them to lose their soul. And I would hate as a parent to think that my kids had never seen me open a Bible, had never seen me pray for whatever reason. And that not seeing that led them down that same path. Prayer is important. Jesus said it was. That's the significance of Matthew chapter 6. Maybe someone here tonight that needs to respond to the invitation. If you are subject to the invitation, whether it's baptism, prayer for strength, won't you come as we stand and sing?